Are you the type of person who stays awake till 3 a.m. and gets random thoughts? And have you ever thought about the place you live in? No, no, I'm not talking about your house. I'm talking about Mother Earth, as far as we know, which is the only planet in the solar system that is habitable. Yeah, did you ever think that how was such a planet formed? And what happened? Why is this the only planet that supports life? I don't know about you, but as a child, I surely did. And if you did it too, then you are in the right place. Today we'll find out how Earth was formed. Before we start, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interesting videos. So, how was Earth formed? Honestly, only the God knows how Earth was formed. All the scientists have been trying to find out the exact formation of Earth, but as far as they could go, they have come up with three theories which they find appropriate for the formation of Earth. There is no definite answer to how Earth was formed, but we would give you or clarity on how it could have been formed and you can believe in which year was theory you find interesting. Make sure to watch this video till the end. The Core Accretion Model The solar system began as a cloud of dust and gas known as a solar nebula around 4.6 billion years ago. As the material began to spin, gravity compressed it on itself, producing the sun in the nebula's core. The leftover debris began to clump. As the sun rose higher in the sky, small particles are pulled together to form bigger particles, bound by gravity. Lighter elements such as hydrogen were carried away by the solar wind, leaving only heavy, rocky ingredients to form smaller terrestrial planets like Earth. The solar winds had less of an influence on lighter materials further away, allowing them to condense into gas giants. Asteroids, comets, planets, and moons were formed in this fashion. Heavy elements collided and were bound together to form Earth's rocky core initially. The lighter material formed the crust, while the denser stuff sunk to the center. Around this period, the planet's magnetic field most likely developed. Some of the gases that made up the planet's early atmosphere were trapped by gravity. Earth was hit by a massive body early in its history, which launched chunks of the newborn planet's mantle into space. Many of these fragments were drawn together by gravity to create the moon which took up orbit around its creator. Earth was hit by a massive body early in its history. Although comets and asteroids traveling through the inner solar system are in little supply now, they were more plentiful when the planets and sun were young. Many of the Earth's water was likely deposited on its surface as a result of collisions between these ice bodies. Exoplanet observations appear to validate core accretion as the primary method of planet creation. Stars and more metals, atoms other than hydrogen and helium, in their cores have more massive planets than their metal-poor relatives. According to NASA, core accretion indicates that tiny, rocky worlds should be more frequent than larger gas giants. A huge planet with a big core discovered in 2005 circling the sun-like star HD 149026 is an example of an exoplanet that helped bolster the argument for core accretion. In a news release, Greg Henry stated, This is a validation of the core accretion hypothesis for planet formation and proof that planets of this type should exist in abundance. The dimming of the star was observed by Henry, an astronomer at Tennessee State University in Nashville. The classifying outer planet satellite, CHEOPS, which will navigate exoplanets ranging in size from super-Earths to Neptune, is set to launch in 2017. The study of these faraway worlds may aid in the understanding of how the solar system's planet evolved. In the core accretion scenario, the CHEOPS team explained a planet's core must reach a critical mass before it can accrete gas in a runaway form. Many physical variables influence this critical mass, one of the most important of which is the rate of planetismal accretion. Cheops will give insight into how worlds form by analyzing how growing planets accrete material. The Disk Instability Model Although the core accretion concept works well for terrestrial planets, gas giants would have had to develop quickly to capture the substantial amount of lighter gases they contain. Simulations, however, have been unable to account for this fast development. Models predict that the process will take several million years, which is longer than the time when light gases were accessible in the early solar system. Disk instability is a relatively new theory that claims that clumps of dust and gas are connected early in the solar system's existence. Over time, these shards combine to form a huge planet. These planets can form far more swiftly than their core accretion counterparts, possibly in as little as a thousand years, allowing them to absorb the rapidly vanishing lighter gases. Exoplanetary astronomer Paul Wilson believes that if disk instability dominates planet formation, it should result in a high number of worlds. The four massive planets circling the star HD 9799 at considerable distances give observational evidence for disk instability. Pebble accretion The most difficult aspect of core accretion is time, constructing enormous gas giants quickly enough to capture the lighter elements of their atmosphere. According to a new study, smaller pebble-sized particles fuse to create huge planets up to 1,000 times quicker than previous studies. 
In 2015, study lead author Harold Levison, an astronomer at Southwest Research Institute, SWRI, in Colorado, told Space.com, This is the first model that we know about where you start with a pretty simple structure for the solar nebula which planets form and end up with the giant planet system that we see. Mikhail Lambritz and Anders Johansson of Lund University in Sweden hypothesized in 2012 that small stones, previously dismissed, might provide the secret to swiftly constructing massive planets. They demonstrated that the remaining stones from this creation process, which were previously used to be insignificant, may represent a big answer to the planet-forming problem, Levison said. Based on that study, Levison and his team were able to predict more accurately how the small stones may create the planets we see in the galaxy today. Previously, both big and medium-sized things consumed their pebble-sized counterparts at a smaller pace, but Levison's simulations showed that the larger objects acted more like bullies, grabbing stones from the mid-sized masses to expand. The bigger man bullies the little guy so they can eat all the pebbles themselves, and they can continue to grow up to create the cores of the planets, research co-author Catherine Kretke, also of SWRI, said. As scientists continue to study planets inside the solar system and around the stars, they will better understand how Earth was formed. All the theories support that Earth is a big piece of landmass, but we know that most of the Earth is made out of the water. From where did the water come? From as there is no concrete mention of water on the Earth's surface, so the answer to that is, ah, you may have guessed it, there is no concrete answer to how the water came. At least part of it was supposed to have been carried here by comet or asteroids, but that explanation still falls short of explaining how such water wound up on the surface of Earth. The ocean water on Earth is comparable to that on asteroids. That's why scientists have long assumed that the majority of Earth's water came from an asteroid bombardment in the early solar system. In diverse water sources, the ratio of deuterium, a heavier hydrogen isotope, to regular hydrogen has a distinct chemical signature. However, Hydrogen in Earth's seas may not be representative of hydrogen on the planet as a whole. Deep into the Earth, at the core mantle barrier, samples of hydrogen had far less deuterium, indicating that this hydrogen may not have come from asteroids after all. Helium and neon are noble gases with isotopic fingerprints inherited from the solar nebula. The very early Earth's surface was once a magma ocean. The first atmosphere was formed when hydrogen and noble gases from the solar nebula were attracted to the planetary embryo. The magma ocean's molten iron dissolved nebular hydrogen, which has less deuterium and is lighter than asteroidal hydrogen. The hydrogen was subsequently pulled into the Earth's core, a process known as isotope fractionation. The heavier isotope, deuterium, stayed in the magma that eventually cooled to form the mantle, while hydrogen was transported to the core by its affinity to iron. Smaller planetary embryos and other objects proceeded to contribute water to the mix. As a result, Earth's interior was filled with noble gases, with a lower deuterium to hydrogen ratio in its core than its mantle and seas. The majority of water on Earth originated from asteroids, although some came from the solar nebula as well, giving you a rough idea. For every 100 molecules of Earth's water, there are one or two coming from the solar nebula. Isn't it incredible how clouds and dust form planet Earth, which is the only planet that is habitable? This was the tale of our journey to learn more about our true origins. The narrative of obsession, hardship, and dazzling invention that includes some of the most contemporary science's most important discoveries that how did Earth actually form? So, guys, what do you think? How was Earth actually formed? Is core acceleration theory correct? Or pebble acceleration? Or do you have some other theory? Please comment down below. Like this video if you found it informative, and make sure to subscribe to our channel for more interesting videos. And make sure to hit the bell icon so you get notified right away.